Thank you for joining us today. I'm Elizabeth Gareb, Executive Director of the Wildenstein Plattner Institute in New York. I'm pleased to welcome our viewers to what I know will be a very interesting and entertaining presentation on the intersection of science and the humanities, specifically the challenges in automated, automatic art captioning. Today's talk will focus on the results of a joint project with the Hasso Plattner Institute that involved creating captions for thousands of unidentified images from the WPI's photographic archive. The images originated from a trove of glass plate photographs and century old photo negatives that were meticulously restored and digitized by WPI and then turned over to the data scientists at the Hasso Plattner Institute for identification using the latest applications of artificial intelligence. Our aim with this endeavor was to see if the expediency of AI could be of service to our efforts in captioning these images for public use and accessibility. For this project, the WPI worked with Alejandra Sierra Munera, a PhD student at the Hasso Plattner Institute in Potsdam, Germany, under the supervision of Professor Dr. Felix Naumann and Professor Dr. Ralph Krestel. Alejandra's research is focused on the analysis of cultural heritage text documents and their connection to visual information and knowledge graphs. And he will be talking to us today about what AI was able to accomplish with the WPI's images. We will then be joined by the WPI's digital assets coordinator, Dana Anderson, who will give us a post-mortem from her perspective as the archivist who is working with the results. After the presentation, we'll have time for a brief Q&A with the audience. So get your questions ready and put them in the Q&A section. And now it is my pleasure to turn the screen over to Alejandro. Alejandro, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Elizabeth. I hope you can see my screen now. I think so, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So, yeah, so, uh, uh, thank you for the introduction, Elizabeth. So, as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm Alejandro Sierra Munera. I'm a PhD student at the House of Plan Institute, and I'm here to present you uh, one very interesting project that we run with WPI uh, and along with uh, some master and PhD students that we were both like a, a group uh, in which we run a seminar trying to basically solve a task that WPI presented to us, which was very interesting and challenging uh, to us. So um, the task that we are dealing with in, in, in this talk and in the seminar that we run, uh, it was about automatic art captioning or the alternative text generation for art. And in general, the task uh, is composed of, let's say you have an input and the input will be an image, let's say a digitized image of, a, of, of, a, of an artwork, like for example, the glass plate uh, uh, images that Elizabeth was mentioning before. And then you will like to have some sort of system on some, some sort of artificial intelligence model that is able to produce something like this. So we will like to have a model that given this image, which was already digitized in a computer, you can generate something which is uh, describing the content of the image, right? So we refer to this as captioning. This is a traditional name for the task that we are kind of solving, but we can also uh, re uh, refer to that as alternative text generation. In that regard, the alternative text generation is uh, typically used in the web context when you want to have something which replaces the image and then you have some description in, uh, uh, as an alternative representation for an image. This is usually related to accessibility uh, um, to improvement. Right, so this is the task that we're dealing with. So we are a computer science uh, research focused institute. So we are kind of trying to solve this from the computer science perspective. And uh, one of the perspectives that we use or, or one of the techniques that we use is machine learning to do that. So typically, if you have a machine learning model, you say, okay, I, wa I want this model, this model starts kind of a sketchy model and what you do is you train this model with examples. So this is the typical uh, training exercise in which a model which is kind of already there is fed or is presented with a, a set of images and text in this, in, in this case. And these images and text are ideally 
human generated so that the model knows what we call a ground truth or uh, let's say a data set in which we have a set of, of pairs of images and text. In this case, we, we are showing, for example, three different images. Each image contains five different captions. So that way the model changes, and this is what we call training. And then we have a model which ideally is able to replicate this type of, um, of captioning exercise that we presented to the model. So this is the typical exercise that we do in machine learning, and this is the instance of this uh, exercise for captioning models. So we, we're not starting from scratch. Captioning is a long studied, let's say, problem in computer vision exercises. Um, in these computer vision exercises, usually you have other types of images, not art related images, but usually like common object photographs in which the models are uh, trained or are uh, engineered to reproduce these descriptions of common objects. One typical example of, of this is using a data set that is uh, published by Microsoft that is called Microsoft COCO, and COCO stands for Common Objects in Context, in which you have a huge data set of around 330,000 images with their corresponding captions, and then a model can be trained to do that, right? So one of the first approaches we wanted to try for our project is, okay, what if we use one of these models, which was already trained, which was already exposed to a big data set of images. Can we use that model to, to apply that on art related images? And, and, and yeah, and this is the first exercise that we that we are going to discuss. Uh, another important thing about this model, this model is part, let's say, of, a, of the research community of computer science and computer vision. So it's backed up by a paper which was uh, published in the International Conference of Machine Learning. Uh, it was developed not by us. It is a model developed by a, a, computer, a computer science research group uh, in, in a company. And it's an open source model. So we could also uh, try to understand how the model internally works to a certain extent, because these machine learning models not always are easy to interpret or easy to understand in their in their context, right? So uh, let's let's say we already have this model. This model you can actually download it and use it directly uh, if you have an internet connection. You say, okay, I'm going to expose this image, for example, which was one of the images that was provided by WPI to us, and I want to see whether. Uh, oh, by the way, this model is called Blip. Sorry, I, I forgot to mention the name. Uh, we want to say, okay, what does Blip understand, and what can Blip say about this image? So if you run this image through Blip, you will have this kind of description. So this description says several pictures are shown with words and images, which to be honest is a relatively uh, accurate description. So I they actually have several pictures. Uh, pictures uh, That's actually good because it means that the, the model is able to understand that it's not only one uh, painting, for example, but it's a collection of images or, or, or pictures. And uh, there are words and images, right? So this is a first approximation. I would say, okay, we, we are starting from something. The, the model already knows some sort of concept of pictures, of words, images. It's already a good start. But then if we present something like this, which is also provided by WPI, we will have a caption like this. It says a black and white, which is, uh, well, let's say a good start. Photo shows a painting. So it's uh, it's if you're strict, it's a it's a correct caption because it's actually showing a painting, but that's not the kind of captions that we would like to present to an end user because the end user is not getting any information about the contents of the painting or the depicted elements or the depicted persons in the painting by these captions. So we start to see that the models, which are already pre-trained on different uh, type of images start to struggle or start to produce uh, captions which are not exactly the kind of captions that we would like to. So we can further see another example. This is a different example. This is not a, a, a glass plate uh, from the WPI data set. This is a, um, it's a painting which is um, openly available on the internet. And it's different, for example, in this case, we have uh, colors, in the other case, we have black and white images, but let's say, okay, what, what if we uh, produce a caption from this, from, from this model with this image? Then we get this, we get two men holding a machine gun while standing on a ship. So then we start to see other types 
of challenges or other types of problems because actually uh, the model uh, is saying that there is a machine gun involved in the in the picture but actually that's not the case this is a different kind of tool that these persons are using to for example measure distance or other kind of things but this is not a, a it's not a gun in this in this case um yeah so this is another example of a caption that can be automatically generated without trying to do any uh, let's say advanced uh, training of other models. This is something that you can already directly download from the internet, already use, and you already can get these kind of captions out of the box. But after not only seeing these three images, but uh, exploring a set of images and a set of uh, paintings and artworks that were, we were trying to caption with these models, we see some challenges which arise there. Challenges which are specific for these kind of tasks that we are trying to solve. So if we want to caption uh, these images related to art, to paintings, or to uh, different kind of artworks, uh, we will like to have these kind of captions, which are very short, like the ones we saw before, with black detail. We would like to have more detail about the contents of the, of the images, which sometimes are factually imprecise. For example, in the case of the machine gun, this is actually not a machine gun, but the model was, was kind of trying to predict this machine gun. And th they are also not using some art specific language. So we we'll also like the model to have something like uh, talk about the composition, perhaps talk about the style, perhaps talk about the colors or uh, different layers of interpretation of the painting, right? So some of, of, of the reasons to, to have these kind of things is that at the end of the day, perhaps you all have heard about language models and language models is a component of these captioning models. So these captioning models have usually a language model at the end uh, that is responsible for generating this text. And if this language model has only seen shorter text, for example, that from the original data sets where you usually have like shorter sentences, then this model will try to replicate this kind of thing. So you will also generate shorter sentences. In the previous images that the, the, the model has seen, there is not too much detail. So that's all the, on, another thing that the model is also trying to replicate. So we have uh, uh, some patterns that come from the original data set that are transferred to this exercise, but not all of them are what we desire. So uh, to give an example of, uh, let's say, a text that we will like to see produced by this kind of, uh, of, of models, then we'll have this. This is not an automatically generated caption. This is actually a piece of text written by a human and actually taken from Wikipedia via uh, some data set that is called Arpedia that I'm going to uh, present in a second. So this is a, a piece of text uh, from the Wikipedia article of this painting and is much more detail. You already see that it's much longer. It has much more detail. I'm going to show you, highlight a few of the things which are interesting from this caption. So first, it, it starts. The painting shows Wick Wick uh, Durstede, sorry for my Dutch, a riverside town about 20 kilometers from Utrecht. So if you start to see here, these are fact, this is factual information about the place which, which is depicted in this painting and also fact information about where this place is located, right? So this is very detailed and perhaps it's very hard for a captioning model to represent this because it will have to have some sort of uh, world model where, where you actually know where this place is located. But this is, this is the kind of detail that we would love to have from these kind of models. Another thing which is very interesting is, I'm going to continue with the text says, with a dominating cylindrical windmill harmonized by the lines of the river banks and sails. So here we see another interesting or different thing from the previous captions is that they use, for example, of adjectives like dominating and harmonized or intensified, which is farther down the, the, the caption or the, the piece of text, sorry, is, is much more expressive than the more simpler captions that we had uh, from the pre-trained captioning model. So this is another interesting fact that we would like to have in this in, in this kind of descriptions that we can automatically generate. And finally, this um, this caption also mentions uh, things which are uh, using more art specific language, like for example, talking about the contrast, the light, the shadows, which are very uh, uh, important when you're we are going to describe a piece of art. This is not 
let's say a random uh, shadow. This is something that perhaps the painter intentionally uh, put there. So it's not something that you just want to ignore in the caption. So it, the, the more of these details that you can actually capture and understand and present in a generated caption, the better that uh, we believe that. So we are not aware of a data set similar to this Microsoft Coco data set, which contains these kind of captions. But we have something which is similar, which actually is the origin of this piece of text. So this is um, a data set called the Arpedia data set. This is a data set which was published by the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia in, in Italy. Um, it contains uh, text from almost 3,000 paintings. And for each painting, you have roughly three visual sentences. And here I'm using visual sentences for something which is similar to a caption, but not exactly a caption. So here you have to understand how these data sets, for example, are built. So, so in this very interesting um, uh, data set, the authors, what they did is they went to the Wikipedia articles of these paintings, and they, they, they basically separated the text in different sentences, and they manually classified, okay, this sentence is talking about the depictions or the visual uh, elements of this painting. So that's what they call a visual sentence. So this is very valuable to us because we already have some sort of connection between visual information and visual text that is uh, that was written by a human. So this is exactly the kind of things that we would like the, the model to replicate. There are other examples which are not as, let's say, as closely uh, uh, as similar to a caption, like the one you see in the bottom from the from the painting that you see on the left. It says Madonna with child and six angels. It's a Madonna painting by Gothic artist Duccio di Boninsegna. So it, it's actually uh, describing the things which are in the painting, but you don't see as many details that as, as you see in the previous uh, piece of text. Nevertheless, it's a much better, let's say, description than the one that you can get, for example, from a pre-trained uh, captioning model. So this is the Arpedia data set. It's also a, a peer-reviewed uh, paper uh, which backs the, the, um, the data set. And you can all actually uh, use this data set. It's also something that you can directly uh, get from the internet and use. So we want to introduce this kind of text or this kind of descriptions into the model. So what we do is we don't start from scratch. We say, OK, there is a model. And this model that we already discussed, which is called Blip, this model already is able to recognize a few things. So that means that this almost more than 300,000 images that the model saw from common objects already gives the model some sort of idea of a few of the elements that you might, for example, find in a painting. For example, if there was a person in these photographs, then perhaps the model already starts to, to, to recognize, okay, there are people in the paintings. But we would like to further train this model, that's what we call fine tuning. That means that we fit this model with even more descriptions. The idea here is to influence the model into using, for example, a different language or using a different, um, ex different examples from which the model replicates different captions or different, uh, yeah, different uh, text. Uh, so that generated texts are different from the previous ones, right? So this is what we call fine tuning. And during our project, what we did is took uh, a portion of the Arpedia data set that is meant for training. We fed this portion of the data set to this blip model. And what we end up is with a slightly different model here for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to call it blip for art, which means that it's blip, but with a kind of an R flavor, if you, if you want to call it that way. So it means that it's blip, the original blip that already recognized a few things, but this is with a special kind of, um, training data that will give it a different kind of uh, text generation capabilities. So then the question will be, OK, what happened after we fine tune this model, after we actually we introduce some more information into this model? So presenting the same image that we already discussed with the original blip model, with this new model, we see a difference in the description. So here, the same image that previously was described, OK, there is a, a set of, of, of images there. Now it says, okay, there are there is a scenes from French countryside is seen here in a pen and ink drawing by Vincent van Gogh. 
There are different elements which are positive. Let's say that will give us information that the this fine tuning actually did something good to the model, which is the the language, for example, that is being used here. Like for example, uh, having words like scenes, pens, and ink drawing, which are more art specialized language, and also the fact that the model was focusing also on the author of the painting. So it could be either that the model already saw a few paintings by Beats and Bagdog during the fine tuning, or that the model is also able to understand a few of the visual cues by the text that you can also find on top of the image. So that's, I would say that this uh, is kind of a, a, a nice uh, caption that is better than the captions that we had before. And we can see other kind of examples. In this example here, another black and white um, image, we, we have the bleep presented these captions. It says, an older man with a full beard and mustache, wearing a jacket, a vest and a waistcoat and glasses. So it's, this also looks like a more detailed description that the, that, that compared to the description that we were getting before, but we start to see some uh, small things which are kind of intriguing. For example, they use a vest and a waistcoat. I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in the difference between a vest and a waistcoat, but I, I will imagine that if you have either a vest or a waistcoat, and you, you cannot have both in the same image. So this is the, these are smaller things that this model, for example, can make mistakes on. And this is typically one of the things that we mentioned when we have we talk about language model. This is we start to 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 see some factually incorrect or some discrepancies or some kind of errors that the model can can commit. But nevertheless, I will say that it's a it's a better caption now. And if we present this same painting that we analyzed before to this fine-tuned blip model, then we have two sailors on the deck on a gloom stormy day drinking a beer. So there are a few elements that change from the description that we had before. First of all, it's, it's recognizing that these two persons are sailors. Okay, that might be true. We are not sure about this, but but looks like they are sailors. Another interesting thing is that it's starting to describe things which are not directly connected to the main subjects. So for example, talking about the weather, which is in the in the foreground, uh, in the background, sorry, sorry of the of the painting, is something that might be interesting for the descriptions of, of our work, not only focusing on the main subject, but also focusing on the context or other uh, visual elements, which is also interesting. But at the end of the caption, you'll see drinking a beer. So this drinking a beer is something which is factually incorrect here. So actually nobody's drinking a beer there, or at least there are no visual uh, cues that can lead you to, to think that this might be true. So. This is what we call hallucinations typically. It, it means that when the language model is trying to produce text, it produces more things which are, which are actually not factually incorrect, not, not factually correct, sorry. And it, it, one of the reasons to that is that we are actually trying to push these models to produce more details. So when the model doesn't know exactly what kind of details has to describe, then it kind of gets for example, there might be some correlation between sailors and beer in 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 the um, in the training set. So the the model might be a, might be um, prone to use these kind of correlations and try to, for example, say, okay, if there are sailors, I might also say that there is beer involved, which is not the case in this painting. This next painting um, uh, that we're going to to look at. We are going to compare the bleep uh, captions with the with the specialized captions. So this is part of the WPI um, data set of, of of images, and it's a very interesting image here, for which the bleep original pre-trained model produced these three um, captions. Uh, the first one says "all time black and white photograph of people in a room." Again, we see the same kind of challenges that we saw before. Okay, this is kind of a too general description is kind of it is correct, but it's too general. Not many, not many details. A black and white photo of people with white clothing, the same thing, but it's it's getting closer. Let's say a group of women are standing around in their uniforms. We also see that even the original pre-trained model can have some sort of uh, hallucination. So here it says a group of women, uh, which uh, it is not completely correct here in this case. So that means that even without the fine tuning, the model can hallucinate. So this is this is a known problem of language model when we are trying to push these models to generate more text. But if we take a look into the blip for our the more specialized model, what was the input? The output, sorry, is two women, one wearing white robe and the other standing. 
which there are there are basically one big problem there is that the amount of people that the, the, the model is describing is incorrect. So there are actually five people in the in the image, but the model is only describing two of them, right? So this is this is, this is a problem there. And the last caption is actually uh, very concerning because this caption is describing Mary Magdalene being laid by Saint Francis, who is pointing to her cross. So this is a typical uh, example in which the model is biased towards um, religious paintings. So you have to understand that, for example, the, the, the data set that we used to find in the model was a data set based on Wikipedia. And Wikipedia has a very strong representation of religious art. That means that there are a lot of paintings that we use to train the model in which religion uh, topics were depicted. So that, that might mean that, for example, whenever the, the model sees these kind of clothes, it's assuming that it, it must be Mary Magdalene or the Virgin Mary or any religious character uh, involved there, which is in this particular case factually incorrect. These people are, are actually not Mary Magdalene and St. Francis. And one last example in, in which I wanted to show you uh, one typical mistake that all these language models or generative uh, text models commit is uh, about numbers. So these models are known to have problems with basic arithmetic operations or basic even counting. And this is particularly one case. So we have 15 coins or 15 elements in the, in the um, image. And none of the captions, not even the pre-trained model or the fine-tuned model, is able to correctly describe that there are actually 15 elements there. So we have eight, nine, eight, six pairs, 12, and eight. So in all of these cases, uh, if, besides more factually incorrect things, like for example, trying to assume that these are Asian coins, um, these are all factually incorrect in terms of the number of elements, right? So this is this, this, the kind of things that we observe, and not only in this small set of images that I'm presenting to you, but in a bigger set of, of testing images that we analyze, um, in which we saw a bunch of problems. So trying to conclude from this uh, initial experiment, uh, we, we have a few findings there. So first, we can actually train models to describe or to generate captions that contains elements of uh, artworks or, or art-related images. So actually, most of the models did describe something that was in the painting. Not everything that was described, not everything was described correctly, not everything was described. Some of the models ignore a few elements from the images, but the models definitely have some uh, descriptions there. The other interesting finding is actually we can influence the language and we can influence the kind of uh, descriptions that the model uh, presents in our case by fine-tuning the model. So, so we fine-tune the model, we present more art-related um, examples to the model and actually a model improves in terms of expressiveness and the, in level of detail in the language that a model is using. However, there are also some uh, concerning or some uh, problematic findings that we have. So first, if we have a model that is already pre-trained on a different type of data, namely uh, common object uh, photographs, then the level of detail and the oversimplification of these captions is not uh, what we will hope to have in an art focus exercise. So this is the, the, the first finding which was said, if we, if we try a model that we can directly download from the internet, probably this model won't be able to directly um, generate the captions that we that we want. But most importantly, both of these models, but more uh, that it was more 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 present in the fine-tuned model, they tend to hallucinate, they tend to uh, make make up uh, information which is not there in the painting, but was observing other paintings, for example. And they also they are also uh, prone to be biased towards certain topics. For example, in the case that we saw with uh, Mary Magdalene, it's a topic that perhaps was strongly, or, or, or there were a lot of samples in the training data uh, related to that topic. That means that the model is also trying to replicate these topics and it's more likely to give captions towards this kind of context. 
So there are different research directions. So we, we as, as a research institution, we are also interested to in, say, okay, where can we go from here? What kind of things we can do to improve this or what, what kind of other research question arise from these kind of experiments? So one thing is the data set itself. So one of the things that we uh, were not able to use is there is no high quality caption data set for art. I'm not saying that our data dataset is not high quality, it's a high quality data set, but it's not a data set intended for captioning. So there is a mismatch between the, the original intention of the data set, which is a description from Wikipedia and captioning. So not having a captioning data set naturally uh, impacts the quality of the descriptions that we, can, we are able to generate via one of these modes. This also leads us to say, okay, how, how can we assess or how can we analyze the quality of these data sets? Because this quality is going to impact the final result. It's really important that we know beforehand how good or how bad a data set and in the context of which task. So it's not the same thing that I'm going to use Arpedia, this data set that we use to, for example, uh, classify uh, um, artwork or I'm going to use this data set to generate new captions. There are different tasks and the, how fit or how, how good or how fit a data set is to each but different, different task, it speaks about the data quality of this data set. Another important research uh, line that we should all focus on is the detection, which is, uh, is we are not only doing that, this is, let's say, a holy grail, a very important topic for the research community in general for language modeling, is the detection of hallucination. How can we detect and potentially also fix, but most importantly detect, when a model is hallucinated or when a model is actually pushing to generate text, even though the model doesn't know exactly what to describe. This is something that we should uh, push to, to have uh, models that detect that and are able to, for example, stop a model from hallucinating or stop a model from generating captions for particular scenarios. Another important thing is how can we ground or how can we um, have more control of this uh, generation? So there are things like, for example, knowledge grounding. That means that we use something that, like a knowledge graph in which we have information that was already created by experts then this knowledge graph will control better the generation of text or things like retrieval augmented and generation, which is a kind of a similar topic in which the, um, the generation is not like uh, from scratch, you generate text from scratch, you generate text based on some information, which is already, let's say, controlled by a vocabulary or controlled by a set of documents uh, which, which are of good quality. And finally, one of the most important things that, that uh, future work should start to study is how these interact with humans or experts. So uh, this uh, concept of human in the loop or expert in the loop in which there, there, there is a interaction both ways. First, how can the humans um, participate in this uh, automatic, not long, not longer completely automatic, but in this uh, machine aided exercise trying to improve these kind of things and for example trying to um, detect these hallucinations and on the other hand how can these models help a human in in their task for example if you have a human which is an expert um, a research um, an art researcher and needs to explore a bunch of images for example how can these automatically generated captions or the model which generate these captions help in the task of this human. This is another very important task that we, uh, we should actively uh, work on. So finally, um, outside of the art captioning task, there are certain risks. So, so one of the biggest risks is if we blindly generate things via these models and these generations are not like controlled in, in a sense. So there are certain things that can go bad. So this is not a captioning uh, exactly exercise, but these are things that people have found, for example, in marketplaces like Amazon, in which the descriptions for the for the, for the products that there are sold there are automatically generated. How can you tell that this was automatically generated? These apologies, but I'm unable to fulfill is a typical answer for models like ChatGPT when they don't know what to answer, when, when they don't have enough information. Actually, it's a step like, after finding an hallucination. So if the model is able to distinguish a hallucination, can apologize. But 
if we don't, if we blindly use this this answer and just put it, for example, in the marketplace here, then this this is not a correct uh, description of our, of our product. And this is a similar kind of case in which the model is answering, and uh, somebody decided to automatically put all the answers from this model into into the wild. A similar and very recent um, case was a case in which uh, an airline in Canada uh, was presenting a chatbot, and the chatbot was in, in essence, was a, a, a large language model uh, that was not generating like factually correct answers. And if, I mean, if an institution presents this, but it's not very clear to the user whether this is an automatically generated thing, which might be factually incorrect, or this is, uh, let's say, truth that you can, you can actually trust, then you can have this, for example, these legal cases in which in this particular case, the airline was responsible for not having the correct information uh, presented by this chat, right? So with this, I conclude my presentation. First, I have to acknowledge that this is not my own work. Uh, this is work uh, that we did in, in, in a master project seminar at the Hasoplana Institute, including uh, some master students that uh, were responsible for, for some experiments, for dealing with some of the data, with running some of the models, investigating some of these models, another P uh, set of PhD students uh, that along me were uh, like, like managing the, the the whole seminar and for Professor Felix Nauman, Professor Ralph Crystal, which were like the, the heads of the of this project. So uh, with this, I, I, I thank uh, Elizabeth, I thank you all. And yeah, I'm really happy to to discuss some some questions or some information. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, but before we address questions from the audience, we're going to turn it over to uh, the human in the loop for the rebuttal, um, Dana Anderson. Uh, Dana is our digital assets coordinator and Dana was on the receiving end of the models finding for all of the WPI image um, and captions generated by the, by the training model. So Dana, um, I'd, I'd love to hear what your thoughts were uh, working with the results of this project. Hi, thank you so much. And thanks Alejandro for that presentation. Um, as Elizabeth said, I've been working with the AI model, reviewing the captions that it generated for a digitized collection of photography. And as Elizabeth also and Alejandro mentioned, our goal with this AI model was to produce alternative text for the images in this collection. Alternative text is a short visual description to give a general sense of an image. It's used by the blind, those with image impairments, or those with low vision access. And it makes it easier to both search and understand the images beyond reading the title, for example. Uh, in Alejandro's presentation, he showed a few examples from our collection, and I just wanted to give a little more background uh, on the collection and why we chose to use it for this project. So at least part of the photography collection has been identified as coming from a, pho a photography agency in Paris that was active around 1900 to 1950. It includes over 3000 photographic prints, negative prints and glass plate negatives. And we chose to use this particular collection for this project because first of all, it's very large. Writing alternative text for this many images is very time consuming. And furthermore, the collection presented a number of challenges. Uh, the images are in black and white, and there's a variety of subject matter, including photographs of paintings, drawings, and sculpture. So when working with the model for each image, I assess the captions generated by the model. It generates, I, I believe, 12 captions per image. And I either select an appropriate caption from the model or I write my own. And when assessing the captions, there's two general criteria. Firstly, there has to be a clear description of the content, no jargon, no assumptions, no hallucinations, uh, which Alejandro uh, explained a little bit. Um, so we have, for example, we have several in the collection photographs of Rodin, uh, Rodin sculpture, The Thinker, and the model was able to describe this photograph 
accurately on several occasions, uh, but some, uh, but not always. And I'm going to read to a few of the disqualified captions, a few of my favorites. One was a photograph of an athletic man leaning forward with his hands resting on his cheek, perhaps due to his depression. Another read, a photograph of an old grubby looking depressed figure. Another said, the sad, old and depressed, thoughtful figure of an old man, a symbol of loneliness. And my favorite, the thinker, the sculpture that inspired Michelangelo. So though these are interesting interpretations of uh, Rodin's sculpture, the thinker, we cannot use them as alternative text. So the clear description of the content is the first criteria. The second is that the photographic medium must be accurately described. And this is particularly important for an archival collection uh, because we're describing digitized objects in the collection, not just the content. So this means for a photographic print, the text must begin with, this is a photograph of, etc. For a glass plate negative, for example, the text must begin with, this is a glass plate negative of, etc. So for the prints, the AI model was able to correctly describe the median, medium on many occasions. However, for the negatives, it's a little more complicated. Some of these are actually two negatives that have then been photographed. And then through the scanning process, the values have been reversed to a positive. So this process is difficult for a human to succinctly describe, let alone an AI model. Um, and as a result, primarily of the second criteria, the majority of the captions generated by the model cannot be used. But I'm still uh, I'm still working on this project. Uh, so far, I've completed about uh, alternative text for almost 800 images of uh, 3,000. Approximately 9% of the captions were generated by the AI model, and the rest I have written myself. So this has been my experience with the model from the human side. Um, thank you, yeah. Jane. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Alejandra, again. Um, we have a question from the audience um, from Joan Bedoin, who writes, since the data set used may not reflect expert descriptions, why not use a data set from a museum? Can you talk about data sets and their availability, Alejandra? Yeah, thank you. So thank you, Joan. Oops, you're frozen. Alejandra, you're back. Hey, hey, can you hear me? Now we can hear you, yes. Oh, sorry, sorry, there was a no thing problem. in my okay. computer, I think. Okay, so I was, I was, sorry, I was saying that uh, one of the research lines that I think that is important is to consolidate these kind of resources. So that there are there are efforts, not particular for captions, there are efforts for, for example, for icon class descriptions. So these icon class descriptions are not directly captions, these are things like uh, uh, particular tags we mention. okay, this is uh, describing the crucifixion of Jesus. This is describing uh, the paradise. This is describing these topics, but these are not like textual descriptions. So unfortunately we didn't uh, come across uh, one single data set. The, the closer that we found was this uh, Arpedia data set. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm super happy to hear if there are uh, there are institutions which are, uh, are are eager to share these kind of captions, and then we we, we can build some sort of data set that we can actually uh, share with the community to to, to have a more balanced, or uh, also more representative data set with better quality. 
Okay, great. Um, another question from Susan Cook. Are data sets such as these being generated in multiple languages? Yeah, not not really, or as far as I have have seen, uh, not really. So the one one big problem of the uh, AI community in general is that most of the resources that you will find for things like natural language processing, which is the the, the field of of dealing with text, are uh, I mean, English is highly represented and you have a lot of English resources in other languages. There are some data sets and there are some things, but uh, unfortunately, most of the languages are not well represented. That's also one of the reasons why using things like knowledge graphs, which are in theory knowledge agnostic, could help with uh, kind of balancing this a little bit in which um, you might have the same name for different paintings in different languages, or the same uh, name for different characters in different languages, and you can relate these kind of things, and you could, in theory, generate the same captions in different languages. Another field is that the, the, the field of machine translation is uh, is very advanced, and if you could have a caption generate a very good caption generated in English, you could translate it to other languages, and you uh, and you wouldn't lose too much information. I would say so. I would say the harder task will be to generate the caption. It will be easier for the model to translate that caption than generated this actually originally in a different language. But it's true that the the in, in general, the AI community is very biased towards English resources. Okay, um, I see uh, Joan has a follow-up. She says, check the Cleveland Museum for museum data sets. Um, another question comes from Akemi May. When you decide to reject the auto-generated captions and write your own, I guess this is for Dana, do those new texts get fed back into the data set to help improve the AI model's future generated captions? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Alejandro, but I think that uh, that is the goal. We are recording all of these basically in a, an Excel document to, to be fed back to the model. Is that right, Alejandro? Yeah, so at this moment it's not happening, but it's something that we want to do uh, after we have a, say, a representative set of, of captions that was that were already uh, assessed uh, that we, we could fit back into the model. And that will also be part of the kind of the human in the loop in which the human constantly kind of correct these kind of things. And that, that's, uh, that's kind of the future work that we want to do. Okay, great. Um, this question comes from Arden Kirkland, and I think it may have already been answered. Have you had the opportunity to get any feedback from screen reader users about the resulting alt text? What was helpful to them or not? Other than Dana, was there who else was was looking at these captions? Uh, ba no, basically the same group that we were like working with the models. So the the master students and the other PhD students, the professor were. Were exposed to the model, but we we discussed obviously the challenges, but there was no no let's say crowd uh, evaluation or some somebody from outside the group. Okay, good. And I think in terms of them being implemented on our side, they have not yet been implemented. Uh, we were hoping to get through this entire collection, and once we are finished, uh, implement them uh, on our website, and at that point. Um, at that, at that point, hopefully we could um, we could get feedback on if users um, are finding them helpful. Right. Um, this question comes from our friend Lisa Weiss. Um, it has been answered, but I'd like to add a coda to this. Do you plan to use Dana's human created captions as data set for the training model further? Um, and my coda to this is um, Ultimately, the human interaction is is teaching the AI model. Um, I wonder, projecting into the future, all of this work that we're doing, will this, the ultimate question of art historians, will it become necessary at some point in the future to um, have humans continually give feedback? I mean, is, is Dana making herself obsolete by giving this feedback? So uh, uh, if I may uh, jump in, so I definitely don't think like uh, it's like going to replace uh, the job. Uh, it might change a little bit the interaction, uh, but it I mean it depends. I guess it depends more on the 
institutions like WPI, uh, how, how we can integrate these kind of things, uh, but definitely these models are not capable of doing the research and reasoning about the, 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 the context of a piece of art or where was it found or these kind of things. Definitely the model is very, is very good at generating, let's say, uh, understandable text, like correct grammar text, but it's, the model is not definitely able to reason and de, do very deep uh, analysis of the things. Okay, there's uh, one comment from Gundren Gundr Naus, who says, here is a source of high quality data available for testing. We are happy to share data from some of our contributors. And Gundren lists a link to graphicportal.org. I'm wondering, um, is there a source or a site that, that um, data scientists are, are going to, to find repositories of data, or is it just individual poking around? And I ask this as a total novice to the fields, where is the grand repository or amalgamator of data sources? Is there one? I don't think there is one single repository. There are a few repositories. Google has a repository of data sets. Some people use it to find new data sets. There are, there are from the research point of view, uh, it all spread out once you have a group of researchers which starts to adopt, uh, let's say, a data set. And then uh, other research uh, uh, groups usually pick up on that and start to use this kind of data sets. So at some point, there must be some connection, like uh, some people talking to other people trying to understand. Uh, I also have to add to that, that it's very important to know the origin or the source of the data in general, mm -hmm. um, because this has an impact on the assumptions that we make about the, first of all, the when trying to design one of these models, and second of all, trying to understand the, 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 the outputs of the model, uh, whether they are good or bad, uh, we also have to make sure that we understand the origin of the, of the data. For sure. I mean, that's something uh, as a person who looks at images all the time, knowing the biases inherent in a collection of images is something that's super important. And I'm wondering within the data science community, is there an attention or a cognizance of those visual biases when training an AI model? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, there are many instances in which that's kind of obscure. But it's uh, it's I would say that's a topic which is now very much studied by many people about the bias, how the bias in the data impact the bias of the models that we are basically automating some bias. Um, so trying to at least understand how this happens and try to understand the impact of that is kind of the first approach, but there is already actively, people actively understanding that. And that's also part of this data, data quality assurance. That means about understanding how good this data set is for this particular task and what is the implication of using this data set, which there, there is no unbiased data set. It's something that doesn't exist. There is also not unbiased model, but at least we have to understand where is the bias and what what kind of impact that does this uh, data set have on this this output? Mm -hmm. So then maybe a, a comment. It's really an argument to for folks to provide robust and diverse data sets because if you have a certain group of people providing one type of data set, it's just going to perpetuate the bias. Very interesting. Um, two more questions. Uh, Interesting. Okay, so one is again from Susan Cook. Fascinating, informative presentation. Would be interesting to have a follow up in a year or so. You are you on, guys, for a follow up in a year or so to see what happens? That's Great. Nice. Okay, <laughs> we'll do it. Um, Margaret Doyle says, "Were any of the images abstract, and if so, how accurately did the auto-generated captions describe them?" Very interesting. Maybe I can speak to that since please, I've gone please. through many of the images. So I would say there, there are a lot of photographs of art, some of that uh, are of, of painting, of drawing, ranging from still lifes to, yes, very abstract, uh, very minimal uh, yeah. painting and drawing. 
and it was not that is that that was not where the model thrived there were also many many portraits in this uh in this collection and those were the most successful uh for for um having an ai caption black and white photograph of a woman or something like that when it came to photographs of artworks it was really it's really challenging because um the caption must say, this is a photograph of an abstract painting uh, that's in black and white. Um, so it, it had a very difficult time, particularly with photographs of artworks uh, being clear that it is in fact a photograph of an artwork and not just an artwork. Alejandro, can you speak to any of that as well on your end with abstraction? Yeah, well, well, we did some exploration for a few paintings. Uh, and yeah, definitely, if you start with like art, which is not like very figurative, but then it already starts to fail. Like, yeah, it's very clear that this the model is not understanding anything. Uh, so it might describe like, okay, there are colors, there is black and white, but not nothing beyond that. And if it tries to do something beyond that, usually it's just hallucination. Right, right. Okay, um, I think we are almost out of time. Um, I don't see there any open questions. And I, I wanna, um, again, thank you both for sharing your insights on this project um, and the results. And I, I'll invite you back uh, in perhaps a year's time to see if we've made any progress and if your model has gotten smarter. Um, <laughs> and again, uh, for those of you who are tuned in, um, you'll hopefully see the results of all of this at some point in the future on WPI website. Um, thanks to Dana and all of her captioning. Um, and uh, please stay tuned um, for more programs like this that we hope to do with HPI in the future. Thanks very much and have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you.